So uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, my name is Haruka Radawish. I'm the Senior Programs Manager at the Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Northern California in San Francisco's Japantown. And uh, we're really pleased today to be able to bring to you a special author talk uh, with our uh, featured author today, Mike Maligan, uh, who is uh, joining us from Hawaii. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, Mike will be talking today about his new book, A Question of Loyalty, uh, which is actually the second novel in um, a planned trilogy of historical fiction novels um, that uh, started with the, the first book in the trilogy, uh, The Picture Bride. Uh, novel. So um, with that, I'd like to give Mike a chance to introduce himself a little bit further, um, you know, explain to us, um, you know, how he came to actually write about, uh, you know, uh, the picture brides and uh, the Japanese American veterans in World War II in this new book. Um, and then uh, from there, we'll uh, let Mike also get into the rest of his presentation, uh, which centers around uh, different historical inflection points that changed the course of the war for our Nisei veterans uh, that also served as sort of the basis for uh, a lot of the, the material in a question of loyalty as well. So uh, with that, uh, welcome, Mike. Thanks for joining us today. Well, good morning, and thank you, Hiroku, for, Hiroka, for um, giving me the opportunity to, to chat a, a little bit. Um, I do get that question often, how does a uh, Caucasian <laughs> from Florida and Wisconsin, Georgia, end up writing novels on the 440-42. And uh, I spent most of my life actually in Asia. I lived in Japan off and on with a home for 10 years, but actually visited almost annually for a couple of weeks, sometimes a month uh, for 40 years. And my wife is from Tuchigi. I met her in Tokyo uh, 40 years ago. We've been married for 32, uh, 32 years. And I was in the corporate world, but in my heart, I was always a writer. And one reason I was able to move up in the corporate world, I could write reports <laughs> and sales manuals and so forth. But I was able to retire early and I was able to follow my fantasy of writing novels. And my first two novels didn't go anywhere. I don't want to talk about them. But I was going to the Maui's Writers Conference on a regular basis. And there was a person giving a speech on writing historical novels. And then I hit myself on the head thing, you know, that's what I read. That's what I should be writing. And a week later, I went to an event, a documentary uh, review, uh, not a review, a launch, where they were talking about why the Japanese in Hawaii didn't end up in the camps like they did in, um, in California. And I was looking for something to write about. And um, I, I had heard about the 442, and I knew there were a lot of nonfiction books that were written. So I thought, well, this would be a worthy project. I'll write a single book um, about this experience. And as I started writing about these amazing men, I thought, well, you know, how do these guys come into existence? Did they just drop out of the sky on December 7th and then, then go on the road to hero ship? So they must have had parents, unusual parents, um, collectively. So I thought I'd write a little tiny backstory about their parents. And um, that little tiny backstory ended up in a 500-page book called Picture Bride. And then we, we start off with a young girl in Kyushu at age 12 um, in the little island of Amakusa. And I don't want to go into, the, into all that. But from that, um, that book ended in the night of um, before Pearl Harbor. And the question of loyalty uh, begins with Pearl Harbor and ends on the eve of the Battle of Casino. And the book I'm writing now starts with that battle and will end up with the uh, 442 saving the uh, Texas Battalion, and also cover the MIS to some degree um, in, the, uh, in the Pacific. Um, but as I wrote, at today's um, talk isn't so much about, you know, chapter one did this and chapter 12 did this, but some larger issues. And we look back on the Nisei experience, and now the, the people who benefit from their heroics, and we think history as it turned out was preordained. And I'm not sure that's, that's quite true. I think there were some lucky breaks and things could have happened either way and not for the best way. So today's talk is gonna cover five subjects and you can see the screen. And to address the original question, why weren't the Japanese and Hawaii thrown into the camps the same way they were on the West, West Coast? And some people say it was economics. Well, it's a little bit more than that. And it had a lot to do with a Chinese man and a 17 year old Al Par girl who lived with the FBI director, and I'll explain that in, in detail. And secondly, um, 
the Nisei were in the ROTC. And when it was activated, they were given guns to guard the governor's mansion and utilities and telephone operations. And six weeks later, they took their guns away, just without a warning. You can imagine the shock of these young men who thought they were heroes, or at least willing to die for their country if they had to, to be humiliated. And that could have been a, a, a ongoing disaster. Something happened to turn that lemon into uh, lemon lemonade. And we'll talk about uh, that. And then when they finally, Roosevelt said, okay, Japanese are, we'd love to have you serve. They all got together in Camp Shelby and it was a disaster. You had people from California and Hawaii, totally different cultural backgrounds. And there was talk about shutting it down, that the experiment wasn't gonna work because they were more interested in fighting each other than they were getting ready to fight Nazis. And number four, we now know that the 442, heroically, they, they had more Medal of Honors, more uh, Purple Hearts than any other um, army unit of that size in the history of the United States. They just set record after record. And we look at that with great pride and we think it's inevitable. Well, it wasn't inevitable. And I'll talk about that. And um, I refused to take the troops. Fortunately, Clark did. And finally, General Del Delquist, those of you who know the name, do not have a warm feeling. And there's a question when the saving of the 442 uh, saved the Texas Battalion, was that necessary? Well, I'll get into that, but more important, much of the legendary status of the 442 was a result of the media following that rescue attempt. It just blew it up um, and it, it created this, uh, added to the myth, I won't say myth, but the legend of the 442. So in some ways, General Delquest uh, helped promote the legend of uh, the 442. It certainly wasn't his intention. So let's take a look and, and go back now to uh, the, the original question, why weren't the Japanese tossed into camps? They certainly was planning. This is Colonel George Patton. You know him later on in history as General Patton. He comes to Japan in 1930, excuse me, comes to Hawaii in 1937. The first report is, is on his, what is the likelihood of war with Japan? He accurately predicts that there will be a war and the Japanese will um, attack before a declaration, because in the entire history of Japan, they've never declared war on a major country until after the attack. So he predicted, and he thought Pearl Harbor, Hawaii could be a possible target. But more important, the following year, he writes a report on the, what happens do you do with the orange people? Uh -huh. Now you can get one guess who these orange people are. But he says, here's his plan in his own words, initial seizure of orange nationals. It's a long report. Fortunately, I'm only going to read one paragraph. <laughs> in the event of a war with an orange country, the army should arrest and in turn certain persons of the orange race, strip the orange community of its leadership and proclaim martial law. This was four years before Pearl Harbor. So the planning and the idea of having the camps was not something that happened. But let's look even a year earlier about these camps and you'll be shocked to see what you have next. No less a person than Franklin Roosevelt. 1936, five years before Pearl Harbor, is already talking. And here's these exact words. He asked, what arrangements have been made relative to concentration camps? He doesn't talk about internment camps. All that marketing idea of changing these to nice phraseology hadn't been invented yet. Concentration camps in Hawaiian islands for dangerous or undesirable aliens or citizens in the event of national emergency. Well, there's no question who these particular citizens are. So the idea of camps in Hawaii, not the West Coast, was talked about much prior. So there was um, a movement to put people in camps when war broke out. It did not happen. Well, there are two special circumstances in Hawaii. First, the leaders in the community knew about the movement of putting people into camps. So it was not a, a secret, the patent report why it wasn't released in its words was, was well known. And so you had here, the man on the left here was the chancellor, Charles Hemingway of the University of Hawaii. Over half the students at the university were Nisei. He had a very high opinion and a very affectionate um, fatherhood you know, with, with his young students. In addition to that, you had three other leaders in the, in the community. The one on the, the left with the, the where well, they're all wearing uh, glasses is Shigeo Yoshida, very prominent in the statehood hearings during the late thirties. 
The man in the middle is the most interesting character. He's a Chinese man, Hung Wai Ching, and he is a uh, professor of a religion, and he's with the YMCA. And again, because he was with the YMCA, many of the people who attended the YMCA were uh, Nisei. So he had a strong affection. And finally, you have Charles Loomis. So these four people, Charles Loomis from the West Coast moved to Hawaii. They got together and say, you know, we have got to prepare our community not to have what they called the California disease. In California, the, the Caucasian community was quite eager to get rid of those people because, you know, they had the land and the, all, all the racial prejudice. Hawaii didn't have it to that degree. Not that they were pure, but the, certainly a, a much more different uh, approach. So they set up a morale committee preparing the community that when war broke out, let's not go into hysterics. And then they got a lucky break. Sue Isanaga is a 17 year old of, uh, student from Maui. She's gonna come to Hawaii. It is the common practice that students from the outer islands would often stay with a Caucasian family and they would do light, ho light housework. At the time she is ready, Robert Shivers, the FBI director, comes to Hawaii for the first time an FBI set of presidents in years as agent in charge. His mission, according to Hoover, Hoover himself doesn't like the idea of internment camps, but you know, he reports to the president. And his mission is to prepare Hawaiian community when war breaks out, how to systematically arrest and move people probably to Molokai. Charles Hemingway meets Shivers and um, says, by the way, we have an Alpar, a young lady, it's our custom here, and she lives with you, and you get a chance to, to meet a local person. She'll do a little light housework. She's not a maid, um, but, and he says, well, no, I don't need a maid. I, my wife and I don't even have children. And he looks at Charles Hemingway, and he sees that this is not the way he wants to start his first day in Hawaii. So he says, I'll tell you what, why don't you let the young lady stay with us for a week or so until you find a permanent resident? In the back of his mind, he is thinking, this is my first time to interrogate or talk to a real Japanese person. Sui Sinaga, and you see the young girl at the bottom, she was at my home seven or eight years ago. She's passed on since that time. She was with her daughter, tremendous mental acuity, and she remembers very well that first night. And I'm not going to go through the entire interview, but I'll go through some of it. I want you to imagine, here's a naive 17-year-old girl from an outer island, very nervous, hasn't been in many big homes, um, certainly not of the style that Shivers was in. And he comes into the living room while his wife is cooking. And she's very nervous. And so he starts asking her some questions. And she's a little nervous on it. So finally, he says, who's your favorite movie star? To break it up a little bit. And Sachko, in the book, I call her Sachko, Breathe easier. Well, she likes Clark Gable, but I like Earl Flynn, too. Hmm, who's your favorite Japanese movie star? A perplexed expression washed across Sachiko's face. I can't speak Japanese so well. And she was a little guilty uh, about it. So you don't go to Japanese movies? Well, I went once with my mother when I was 10 or 11. <laughs> I fell asleep. Ah, so your mother goes to Japanese movies. Well, sometimes, but not so much anymore. Her favorite actor is William Powell. A little boring for me, but she likes Gabby Hayes, and we both like Westerns, and we wish Gene Autry and Gabby Hayes would make a movie uh, together. Then he moves on a little bit. You go to those Japanese language school. Sachiko's lips turns down, telegraphing unhappy memories. Yes, my father runs one of those schools. We hated it, and once we, once we got to junior high school, and trained to ignore such requests from hundreds of suspects he'd interview, Shivers continues, what did you learn at your father's school? Well, I can write my name in kanji, read simple signs over Japanese uh, shops. Uh, father taught us Confucius's golden rule, do not impose on others what you do not wish for yourself. Respect the elders, take good care of them, honor our teachers. Then Shivers goes on a little bit later, he says, ah, but Japan has modernized very quickly. You must be very proud to be Japanese. And Sachiko, I want you to remember, this is Sui Sanaka at 83 telling me the story. Sachiko snaps her shoulders back. I am not Japanese. She pressed her fingers on her right hand and her upper chest. I'm American. In leaning forward, she pressed her fingers harder. I'm proud to be American, Mr. Shivers. And Shivers probably felt he had overstepped some type of 
boundary with the naive 17 year old girl. The following morning, as Shivers drove to his office, he studied the many Asian faces he passed down the street, mostly neatly dressed, talking to each other. And that's when the doubt of Shivers started to wonder. Because this little girl, Sui Sinaga, or Sachiko in the book, except the look of her eyes was different from the high school girls he went in Nashville. She talked just like them. She talked about Clark Gable. She was a typical American teenager. In his mission to intern people, he began to have doubts. So you take those doubts from this 17 year old girl put in his mind, along with the morale committee, you can see that the possibilities. But let me get, continue with the story. The week passes. He keeps Sue with her, with them. She becomes part of the family. In fact, he starts introducing her as his daughter because they never had daughters. And she became the daughter they didn't have. And a few years later, when she married a Nisei coming back from the war front, he was her best man. And until his deathbed, the two families were very close and very tight. So I think Sui Sinaga played a critical role and why most Japanese in the islands did not, were not interned. 2,000 were arrested, leaders of the community. They were kind of the scapegoats or the sacrificial lambs for the other 100,000. Well, let's go on to a little bit more what happens after the war starts to see if all this preparation was necessary. In February 1942, FDR writes a memo to General Emmons, who is the commander of the Pacific Army. He says, I've long thought the Japanese should be removed from Oahu to one of the other islands. Secretary Knox, who's really anti-Japanese, he's the Secretary of Navy. Personally, I shall always feel dissatisfied with the situation until we get the Japanese out of Oahu. So General Emmons is under a lot of pressure. He does not succumb to the White House pressure, as we know. But here's another critical factor of why the Japanese lucked out as a group in Hawaii. You've got two army officers. One is General Emmons on the left. You can see he's in Hawaii shaking hands with somebody. Next to this is the famous General DeWitt. General DeWitt is anti-Japanese. He's the one that says, once a J, always a J. And he has all sorts of anti-thing. He relishes his role when he gets the 9066, the letter from Roosevelt saying, put people in the camp. Boy, he, this is his thing. What would have happened historically if the roles had been reversed? Suppose General DeWitt had been the person sent to Hawaii and Emmons to the West Coast. DeWitt is a stonehead. He, he wouldn't care about uh, the FBI report. He was going to do what he did. Anyway, General Emmons had an open mind, listened to uh, his reports and realized that the Japanese as a whole probably were just as loyal and nothing to worry about. And he did not send them to camps. He kept dragging his feet until Roosevelt let it go. When war broke out, we're going to go to point number two here. When war broke out, the ROTC at the University of Hawaii uh, was activated, became the Hawaii Territorial Guard. They all took the pledge. They were given guns and arms. They became part of uh, an adjutant of the army. And they guarded the governor's mansion, they governed uh, um, utility operations, they put barbed wire on the beaches, they were all in. And the early days, they thought there would be an invasion. In fact, if, if um, Yamamoto had in landed Marines, uh, Hawaii probably would have been captured, but it didn't happen. But six weeks later, they get called up early to go to a, a school early in the morning, thinking maybe they're gonna get an award, maybe some of their parents will be released from Sand Island, those who had been arrested. Instead, they were told they've been reclassified as enemy aliens. Leave your guns here, you're out, we don't want you. The officer who gave the report had tears in his eyes because he knew that uh, they were as loyal and he'd been with them. But anyway, they were out. What would have happened if that was the end of the story right then and there? You would have had all these angry people having a, a, a grudge, as most of us would, for being so despicably dishonored. When they left the um, school, outside was Hung Wai Ching. And he looks at them, he says, you boys have been greatly um, dishonored. What are you gonna do about it? And they look at him, what do you mean we're gonna do about it? There's nothing we can do about it. He said, no, yeah, there is, you have a choice. You can do something about it. 
And so they're befuddled. But Tetsukiyama, the person on the top right, who later becomes a historian, and also on the left, they get together and they come up with an idea of what they can do. And so that evening, 169 people sign a statement. And here's what they send to General Emmons. Hawaii is our home. The United States, our country. We know but one loyalty, and that is to the stars and stripes. And we wish to do our part as loyal Americans in every possible way. We hereby offer ourselves whatever service you may see fit to use. Well, General Emmons is, is shocked, but he also agrees with Tung Wai Ching that keeping these boys busy and some other service is much better than having a, a, a group of sulking people in Hawaii. And so he's very clever. The Washington has told him that he has to release all the civilian uh, Japanese workers that are in Fort Island and Pearl Harbor. The same day he does that, he activates what is called the Varsity Victory Volunteers. And all the men who signed the agreement, some others, joined the Varsity Victory Volunteers. They got uniforms. They lived on the military base. They weren't, mil they weren't soldiers. They had a special designation. They were Varsity Victory Volunteers. But they had off, you know, uh, officers from um, there in, in charge of them. And you can see from the pictures, they were willing to do the dirty work. Well, the story gets more interesting. They did this for a year. And they had, the island had a visitor, Eleanor Roosevelt, as you can see here. And one of the people that was designated to take care of her was Hung Wai Ching. He appears quite often. He takes her on the base, drives by so that she can see these young men working. Whether that was the tipping point that got Roosevelt to change his mind or there's other issues that helped him, but shortly thereafter, he then uh, sends out another letter saying, um, an American is a question of character and commitment, not a question of race. We welcome everybody to join the army. And you can see in the picture on the right here, these are the varsity victory volunteers signing up to join the United States Army. Victory. Again, a lot of circumstances had to make this to go happen. You had to have General Emmons. You had to have, uh, you know, Roosevelt, Mrs. Roosevelt come by, et cetera, et cetera. So now let's go to the third tipping point, or the third thing that could have gone either way. Now people can join the Army. The Army, in its wisdom, figured that two thirds of the volunteers would come from the West Coast camps, and one third would come from Hawaii. Well, how naive. The most, uh, there are 10,000 uh, men uh, in Hawaii signed up for the uh, military, and uh, about 3,000 were accepted. The West Coast, not so many, as you can imagine. They're, they're in camps. And um, there's a lot of anger. In fact, the um, boys from the camps, they have to sneak out at 3 o'clock in the morning because there's a lot of division, should you join or not to be joined. And you can imagine some young men say, how can you join an army with our parents in, in the camps? And others wanted to prove that the American had made a huge mistake and only by willing to die for their country. Hawaii boys were totally different. This is their send-off they got. They were getting lays. Um, you can see the men gambling. All the relatives are competing who can give the most money. They left when they got on the ship loaded with cash and presents and everything. Where the guys sneaking out of these camps, you can see the, the, what, they were, what they were leaving. Um, they didn't leave with any, any money. Maybe they had $2 to get a bus uh, somewhere. And so they arrive at the camps. Now, Hawaiians have their own language. They're happy-go-lucky. They wear flip-flops. They're kind of casual. They get together and party. And they've been together as friends, you know, in the same community for years. Now you've got these um, Nisei from the camps, from different, different camps, different backgrounds. They're much more sophisticated in their language. Most of them are more, more of them are, are Christians. And so they end up fighting. And they're talking about nasty, you know, Donnie, Donnie Brooks. And so they come up with pejoratives for each other. And the uh, Hawaiians call the uh, mainlanders katonks because that's the sound of a, of, a, of, a, of a coconut hitting the ground, katonk. So they call them katonks because when they have fights, they always end up on the, on the ground. Um, and the Buddha head is an, an amalgam of two words, Buddha for Buddhist, and also it's a, um, next to pig. So it's a pejorative. They call them, you know, pig heads, really. And so on these two pejoratives was the basis of their relationship. 
And it got to a point where finally, General Pence and said, Colonel Pence said, you know, I don't, this might not work out. And they were talking about disbanding it. Somebody, I think it was one of the chaplains say, you know, let's try one more thing. What would happen if we sent some of these Hawaiians to these camps? And there were two camps close by. And you can see the picture on the left down here. This is a USO dance. The girls from the camp sometimes would be bussed in for weekends. So they knew uh, some of these Hawaiian boys, but even these USO parties was a cause for problem because the girls being camp girls tend to migrate towards the boys from the camps. And they spoke the, you know, the King's English or the American English, as opposed to the pidgin English that the Hawaiians often spoke among themselves, even though they they could speak uh, perfect uh, English when they occasion called for it. And one of the people that went on the uh, tour of these camps was Danny anyway. And He's on the, he talks about being on the flatbed um, on the way to the camp and they turn down a road in this little gravel road and they're practicing their hula dances the, on the ukulele and they're going to do a hula dance for the party and everybody's excited in anticipation. And then as the truck gets closer to the camp, they see the barbed wire. They see the guard towers, insider men with machine guns pointing inside the camp. When the flatbed is stopped, other young men of similar rank with guns pointing at the Nisei in, in there say, we have to search you. I don't know if the guns are pointed, but they were armed. And they actually searched them. And then they got into the camp and they saw the open toilets and they're trying to imagine their grandmother having to do their business with no front doors. Now it wasn't that anybody could go by. They had a women's section, but still the toilets had no front doors. They saw the the food at, at, at the main area. And then they learned that the good food that wasn't all that good, they had been saving money just so they could have a little bit of meat and some better vegetables. It was a shocking experience. And after a day and a half or two days, they, they go back. And here's Danny Inways from his book, uh, Journey to Washington. And he summarizes it for all, all of them. He says, I wonder what I would have done if it had been me and my parents inside that camp. Would I have volunteered for a country that betrayed me? Remember, we volunteered from a close-knit community that is generous and supportive of what we're doing. Our families haven't been forced out of their homes and herded into backward prisons, never knowing when it will end or what kind of life is possible when this camp nightmare ends. But those mainland boys volunteered while in these camps, willing to die for a country that locked up their parents and siblings. Well, as you can imagine, after that experience, the problems between the Buddha heads and the Katanks practically disappeared and they realized the enemy was the Nazis, not, not each other. And they formed what became the famous uh, 442 unit. Let's move on to the fourth area. We know the Nisei were heroic uh, in the battles. We know the number of casualties was, was huge, but it was not preordained that they would fight. There was a lot of skepticism of the loyalty issue, which is why I call my book a question of loyalty. There was also, and amazingly, if they had the guts to fight, this is kind of ironic because in Guadalcanal, the Japanese proved that they were very tough soldiers. So how they would think the Nisei that they were afraid of being disloyal, wouldn't be great soldiers, I don't know, but they did. Eisenhower refused them. Fortunately, Eisenhower was taking a lot of troops from Clark's Italian soldiers for the later um, you know, invasion of Europe. Clark had a prior predis predisposition of feeling good about the Nisei. He didn't see a problem with them, thought they might be motivated and welcomed them. But when the 442 landed in Africa, they were told after they got there, well, you're not gonna see combat. You're gonna be here and guard um, the camps here because the Arabs will steal anything. Well, there was very strong arguments, which I record in my book between uh, Colonel Pence and some of the uh, other officers about being allowed to fight. Finally, General Ryder, who's in charge of the major division they'd be come to, he said, are you absolutely sure these men will fight? And of course they said, absolutely. And of course they did. They landed in Salerno a couple of months after the general invasion. 
And um, up until Casino, they, when they landed, they had 1,300 uh, troops. Now, this is not the 442nd. I should go back for a second. There were two groups, and sometimes people uh, get them mixed up. So I'm going to take a little time here. The 442 were new enlistees, new volunteers. Prior to World War II, there were over a thousand Nisei already in the United States military in Hawaii in different non-combat units. Eventually, they were sent to Wisconsin for combat training. And they are the first group to go to Italy. And it's the 100th. These are veterans. They, and they're in their mid or late 20s because they've been in the Army um, for a while. And it's the 100th that land. So they not only have to prove they can fight, but if they don't do a good job, of course, they will close down the 442nd. Looking back now, it's amazing that people would say, well, of course, they're going to be fighting. But there was a lot of skepticism. So the 100th had a lot of pressure on their back. They had the pressure, of course, of like any soldier proving the fight. Uh, they were fighting an enemy, the Nazis. They were fighting for dignity to prove that their uh, America had made a mistake. And they also had to prove that they could fight well enough so that their companions from the 442nd in Camp Shelby, Mississippi could join them. So they land with 1,300 uh, men. By the time Casino is the Battle of Casino is over, they have what is called 521 effectives. Now that doesn't mean 800 people died. A lot did die, but there were others that were in the hospital. Some were sent homes, some had frostbite. But the reality is, after four months of campaign, they only had 521 men fit to, fit to fight. The Caucasian units had no problem. They get replacements coming in all the time. Only a Nisei could replace a Nisei, and the 442 were still in training. Well, I'll go some of the personal stories of bravery that I thought you might like to enjoy. The first casualty of the 100th was Joe uh, Takata. Joe was sort of famous already in Hawaii. He was a baseball player. There were talks he might end up with a major league contract. Who knows? But he was on the newspapers, and he was the guy. And uh, when they played baseball um, in Africa against the um, larger um, Texas units, um, Joe was the star of the, of the game. And um, being an A-type personality, in the first battle, of being pinned down by Germans, he says, I'm going to get up and Lead by, lead by troops. He gets up and he's hit by shrapnel right away, falls down and puts his arm out like a, like a chop and says, carry on, carry on, carry on, and he dies. That's not the end of that story. And when his parents, um, they're given funeral money, they're told that their son had died, he got a, a distinguished cross and they picked up $400 from various relatives and friends, because that's the custom in Asia. You give money to help defray the cost of the funeral and compensate for the loss of life. And they went to the American Red Cross in Hawaii with the envelopes and said, we think Joe would want us to give you the money. And they not only, they set the example, because afterwards, other Nisei families in Hawaii did the same thing. When they got their funeral money, they donated it to the Navy Relief Fund of the American Red Cross. So now you know the rest of the story. There were other heroes in the casino. There were three Medal of Honor winners. Um, they didn't get the Medal of Honors at the time. The Army Brass was somewhat worried about giving too many medals. Parents in camps, heroes. So they, they were given medals, but not what they deserved, the Medal of Honor. They got those years later. But Private Hayashi and Ota, um, they were pinned down by German machine guns. They got up, they were not killed, back to back. It's almost like a Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, movie. Um, twice, one of their machine guns was hit by bullets and machine gun was ripped from their hands. They went back and picked up another one and they ended up killing 57 Germans and taking out the uh, machine gun nest. Uh, and neither one of them was scratched. An, an, an amazing miracle. The same day, Private Mikio Hashimoto had a similar experience by himself, again, jumping up out of his foxhole, charging a, a, a machine gun nest, and personally killed over 20 uh, Germans and, and cleared the area of the machine gun nest. For that, they were given a Distinguished Medal Award later on. They were brave. 
I am, I'm going to move on to the, um, of, I, anyway, I'll, I'll end with the um, obvious, the 100th proved that Nisei would, would fight. <laughs> and after that, there is no question. In fact, they fought so well, uh, they were often used uh, by the various commanders. When it going got tough, they were the ones that uh, were, were sent into the battle. Let's go to the last part of my um, plan presentation, and that is the rescue of the Texas Battalion. I'll give a little bit of a background to that uh, particular battle. Uh, the Germans had been defeated, and, uh, but there were still a lot of them up on a hill. And Dilquest told the Texas group, one battalion, I want you to charge up that hill and take advantage of the forward movement. And they said, wait a second, there's Germans on the right, there's Germans on the left. If we go up there, they could come down and encircle us. And Bill Costa's officer said, oh, don't worry about it. We've got another battalion right behind you uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. So Texas battalion goes up there and sure enough, the Germans on the flank circle it. And it's a big news story right from the beginning. And Hitler personally hears about it and says, you're the no way that these guys are gonna get out. You're gonna get them. There's about 250 Texans in, in the group. Bill Costa sends two of his own units from these Texas um, boys um, to relieve more Texas boys. And they both come back and they fail. And again, the newspapers are picking this up on the States because there's nothing like a lost battalion. Of course, they weren't lost and encircled. In the meantime, you've got the 442 who have been fighting in Brueres, which isn't that far from where there's battle. They had a 10 or 12 day battle. It was a tough battle and they uh, liberate there at high cost of casualties. So they're pulled back and told you need to rest for a couple of weeks, regroup, get new uniforms, and you know, real rest. Well, 36 hours later, they're told they got to go back again. They were shocked. They were angry. well. We knew that it worked, and it was a hor horrific action. Um, it's hard to um, um, imagine. I'll take a, a a look at some of the, the the pictures I have here, and this is the soldiers up here going up to the uh, to the to the line. But what you had here, you had 56 of the 442nd were killed. A lot of people say there were a couple hundred. There wasn't. It was still a lot of deaths over, over the rescue. 300 were wounded, and they saved 207 Texans. So 50 Texans lost their lives as, as well. General Delquest was um, reputed by his own officers, not uh, directly at the time, making a horrible mistake. He was not an experienced combat officer. Shouldn't have been in his post, probably. And uh, it was uh, a lot of people probably died, not probably died unnecessarily because of his reactions. The other side of the coin is the purpose of the bravery of the 442nd and 100th men was always to prove that America had made a huge mistake. They wanted to be known as a group of men who were truly American. And so General Dilquest, not for intention, gave these young men media time and proved to the United States in such a dramatic way the horrible mistake that they were made. After this battle, and the camps, of course, were still kept, but there were more furloughs given and things like that, and America began to doubt um, the mistake they made. So General Delquest is certainly no hero, but he did go a long way to um, build a legend of the 440, uh, 442nd. I will um, answer the question. Uh, the, bring up the question, were the soldiers what they called expendable? And there were questions, and here it is, were the soldiers expendable or did their valor and no retreat attitude make them the, the go-to unit when a military objective was, was critical? And when I go to these reunions, people still debate, were they cannon fodder because they were Asians or Japanese and were considered as important as Caucasians? Or were they used because they're so damn good, like a baseball manager, as a relief pitcher, and uh, he keeps using them over and over because ninth inning is tough. And maybe he uses the relief pitcher one time too many and he breaks his arm, but he wants to use his best pitcher. Um, one of the people who followed me on my Facebook um, wrote back to me when I had this issue debated, and he said, I have two uncles, this is Todd Yushishima, that were part, took part in the rescue battalion. He asked that one question about the expendability and what his uncles told him he said they were American soldiers first, a brotherhood. 
many of these soldiers I talk to, veterans, um, while they still debate, I would say there's a slight majority that feel that they were just too damn good. They, um, when the going got tough, they were called on. They didn't retreat. Um, and because of that, they were called on to, uh, to do it. But there's still debate. And did subconsciously some of these officers overuse the Japanese because they were expendable or because of their um, bravery and, and valor? I'm going to end on a personal note. I had a went to uh, the place where the battle, the, the Texas Battalion, last summer. And this here is uh, Glenn um, Hajiro, and his dad uh, was a Medal of Honor winner. Again, the delay, and this Frank Ono uh, from ABC, kind of famous in Los Angeles as a news broadcaster and a supporter of all things on ESA. He discovered, Frank did, the exact location where his dad got the Medal of Honor. And this is the, the situation that allowed me to come. I was like a voyeur. I'm sitting there listening to this. But Helgiro and his buddy are pinned down on the bottom of the hill. And you got machine gun Germans up there on top of the hill shooting down. And Helgiro says, if we stay down here, we're just going to eventually get picked off one by one. We, we got to move up the hill. So he and his buddy, both of them with the own machine guns, get up. His buddy gets killed instantly. Bullet falls on the ground. Ajiro now has a, less than a split second to make a decision. Does he go down to help his buddy, who's obviously dying or dead, or does he charge up the hill? He charges up the hill. The Germans don't get him. And he gets up there and takes out three machine gun nests single-handedly. And, of course, then the rest of the men move up. For that, later, he got his Medal of, uh, Medal of Honor. My last slide is after the rescue. Dilquest says, I want to have all the men, an honor guard, not an honor guard, I want them to march and I want to give them an honor and I want them to have a review. So Dilquest is on you know, the, the, the review stand and he sees these soldiers and he says, I ordered everyone here, where are they? And Colonel Miller looks at him in the eye, says, this is all that's left of the 442nd sir. Years later, Gilquest went to, um, not a reunion, but to some kind of a function where some of the men from the 442nd were there, including officers. Gilquest went over and says, well, let's bygones be bygones, and went out to shake his hands. And the other officer gave him a salute and walked away. I didn't forget the way he used um, used people. Well, on that note, I'm going to call this the end of my uh, planned uh, presentation. And uh, Haruka, do you have uh, any questions for me yourself or from uh, folks listening in? Uh, yeah. So um, first of all, thank you. That was that was an amazing presentation. Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, historical tidbits that uh, I actually hadn't heard before. So. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, providing that information for us. Um, and so I think, um, first of all, for anyone in the audience, uh, if you have a question for Mike, uh, go ahead and enter it into the chat box and um, I'll relay that question to Mike directly uh, so he can answer. Uh, so feel free to, to ask him any questions that you have about his writing um, process or um, you know, some of the information that he presented on the 100th and 442nd. Um, but I'll go ahead and start with a question of my own. Um, and um, I think one of the things that struck me uh, when you're going into um, sort of the, the historical inflection points of your presentation uh, was the fact that you were able to actually cite directly from a primary source, like when you mentioned the au pair, uh, right. that, um, you know, uh, you're able to actually have a, a, an interview. Um, so I think it's really rare to be able to speak directly to a primary source when you're doing this sort of research. Yeah, yeah given um, the age of people, yeah. Yeah, um, so I was uh, wondering if you could maybe uh, talk a little bit about your overall uh, process in doing the research for the book um, and how you're able to connect uh, in person with some of uh, the, the folks that provided you with firsthand accounts and uh, how that translated into the final work. Yeah, let me give you two perspectives. One is the, the personal, the people part, and the other is the geographic part. And um, I visited only one or two places that are mentioned in either book that I did not 
visit. Uh, I did not visit the, the camp that I used, but I did visit Camp Manzanar and also the uh, uh, the replica that you have at the Japanese Museum in Los Angeles. So every place in the book, I have been there. And when I visit these places, uh, scenes appear in my mind. I'll give you an example. In Picture Bride, um, Har Haru, my, my Picture Bride, she is sold into the pillow trade. A lot of the girls in Amakusa, because of historical, were sold by their, by their parents. But she escapes her fate, obviously, otherwise it'd be a different book. And she's raised in a temple, a Buddhist temple in Hiroshima. Now I picked this particular temple because it was outside the, the bomb zone. And I get to come back in book three when her children go to the same temple and it becomes a field hospital after Hiroshima. The um, main priest, at the temple there, but he was very kind to me because I told him I was writing a book and I wanted to use his temple as some stories. So anyway, um, I, I talked to him, he gives me the history and I walk inside the main part where people would pray and there's a wooden 700 year huge Manungas Buddha, the Buddha of, um, of being a doctor. I'm the only one in there that day and it really is dark and cloudy and, and dank and there's candles all over the place as Buddhist temples will be. And I knelt down, in those days I could still kneel, <laughs> and um, I said, this is a place that people come to make major decisions. And at that instant, because I knew I had to have a break point of how Haro was going to get from Hiroshima to Hawaii. And that inspired me, because I could imagine her and her adopted family inside there discussing what the options were. And sure enough, a couple months later, I wrote the scene that was what I call, an, within the book, an, an critical point. And there were other point, there's a bell. You walk in there and there's this huge bell. And it's one of those bells you have to take with both hands and pull down and a huge one. So I said, boy, that's a story. And yes, I have a great scene in the story where Howell comes out and rings the bell um, because the battle of Tsukushima has been won. And she wanted to be the first person in Hiroshima to ring that bell, to, again, to prove her loyalty. So yeah, visiting places, um, really inspires me you know and i know when i uh the scene i just told you about of um harjiro um you know losing his friend and charging up the hill that'll be in the book because you know it's just too dramatic not to um then there were the people part i have a mentor one of the people i met early on was a member of the 522nd which is the artillery in fact a lot of my book uh, talks about the artillery and cats miho cats are cats ago everybody called him cats and he and I, I met him in the beginning, just, just a historical. And then we got talking more and more. We started meeting regularly every week at, at Zippy's. And pretty soon, he became like my surrogate father. Because my own father had problems, the alcoholic and so forth. And he was telling me stories. I was a new audience. And so, you know, I hadn't heard him before. And then he started telling me stories his family didn't know about. Now he's passed, and I've told a couple of the stories, but not all of them. <laughs> Um, and when our 20th wedding anniversary came up, uh, he officiated to the renewal of our, of our vows and his wife, uh, Laura, who's still there, picked out the wedding dress, you know, the renewal dress, a very Hawaiian style. So, you know, it's just unexpected that you meet people um, like I meet you just now, but because your proximity, you meet them often and pretty soon they become friends. You probably know about... Uh, uh, Seuss um, Ito uh, in Boston. He's kind of famous because he took all those pictures. Well, he invited me to his home. I won't say I had the same close relationship, but when the Nisei opened up that, and the government opened up that special Nisei designation of the Army um, World War II Museum in New Orleans, he invited me for the opening. And I thought that was a very special occasion. But he had all these pictures. Now they're with the Japanese Museum in Los Angeles. But he shared them with me. And of course, many of the pictures were very inspiring. Um, and he told me how he took the pictures. He wasn't supposed to do it, but he had his little tiny Kodak in those days. And the officers kind of blinked. They didn't, he didn't think he was a spy. And now they become part of the heritage. So yeah, there was a lot of people that you meet um, and they tell their stories. And less and less of them um, now. Ted Tsukiyama, which you saw before, he was one of the first people I approached, and he put me on to a lot of different books and places, go to the University of Hawaii archives and things like that. So, um, yeah, and then you meet people. I met uh, Lawson Sakai. You know Lawson? Oh, yeah, he's well known. Yeah, well, uh, he, he was a book reader. In fact, the last year when I was with him, uh, he got an early copy 
and he chided me, you've got to write faster. <laughs> he just passed away a few weeks ago. Yeah, he had an impact. If you meet Lawson, you remember Lawson. He's just one of those charismatic uh, people um, that did. I was very honored to be with the group this last year um, when he was the only veteran to go uh, on it. And they needed him. They, the French needed him. They wanted to give somebody thanks. And I can tell you this. I know I'm digressing. The French have not forgotten what the Nisei did. I, I'll tell you one story. I think we've had time for this. The first time I went to Bruyere is seven years ago, six years ago. There were seven Nisei. And they were marching on Bastille Day in Bruyere. They were the honored guests and Bastille Day, the French you know, Independence Day. And there's seven of them are marching. Not too fast. You know, they're in their early 80s by this time. And as they're walking along the sidewalk, two elderly ladies about the same age just walk out in front. They face the men. Each of them just takes one of them and gives them a hug. Not a word is spoken, but we all heard. And then he walked back to the sidewalk. I don't know what that moment is worth in life, but I can tell you, every Bastille Day, I remember that moment. And when I do talks like this, I remember that moment. What is that worth? So that's one of the byproducts sometimes when you write books, the unexpected consequences of um, events, meeting people, dramatic moments in your, in your heart. So it's a, it was a moment. Sure. Okay. Um, so I, I do have another question. Um, and I think this uh, kind of takes a bit of a step back in perspective to sort of the, the trilogy of books that you're, um, you've been writing uh, sort of in its entirety. But can you talk about how Pictured Bride was first conceived and then how you transitioned to uh, the second book um, and sort of shifted the focus there uh, and then sort of what you have in mind for the, th the follow-up, the third part of the trilogy. Will do. Let me tell you the inspiration of my picture bride. And this is a dramatic story. I'm in Taiwan in the mid nineties. And uh, I want to, we going, my wife and I are taking a trip to Malaysia, actually Sabah, which is one of the provinces in Borneo. And I'd heard about a orangutan um, preserve. So I wanted to visit that. My wife said, no, I want to go visit a Japanese museum. I mean, a Japanese uh, cemetery. I'm thinking it's one of these cemeteries, World War II soldiers. And I've been to one or two and the Japanese have not done a good job, but you know, you honor it and you do your three prayers. So I went to the cemetery, I went to the cemetery, except all the um, little uh, markers are people dying in 1898 or 1905. And they're dying in, within 20 years. They're dying as teenagers or early 20s. And I, with Tomoko, she says, no, this is uh, from Sandakan 8, the book about girls from Amakusa that were sold into the pillow trade. And these girls came over there. And let me tell you, I looked at the, I know prostitutes are considered the dregs of society. I looked at these women as heroes. I'll tell you why. Their parents would sell them when they were 12, 13, or 14. And as soon as they reached puberty, they went from being maids into the, to the pillow trade. And the parents got money. Now, the smart girls, as they got money, would pay back the advance money to the procurers. That's not what they did. They sent money home so their parents could get a house or their brothers could get an education. And many of them died. A few came back, and one of them, a girl named Tomoko Yamazaki, wrote a book about it, and there became a movie called Santa Con 8 about what these women. Okay an emotional moment, forgot about it. Now I'm gonna write a book and I'm writing the book about the soldiers and I'm gonna write about their parents. And then it inspired me. I thought about that time I went to that girls and I said, what would happen in Amakusa if just one of those girls escaped her fate? And that girl is Haro. So I went to Amakusa, some great scenes in Amakusa, um, walked up there and, uh, I, I can't, I'm giving too much away, but some of the early scenes that are very dramatic, I, I walked up there and, and were inspired, the, the bridge that I talk about. And, and so going to places um, like that inspired uh, how that uh, book got. Um, and then I did, the other part of the picture bride, I wanted to let the reader know is what was happening in Japan. And as you read the book, you can see that the war with America really was inevitable. You could see things that were gonna happen. The 1924 Immigration Act, 
which stopped all Japanese immigration. Some people say that was the start of the Japanese American War. Yomiri Shinbun, when that bill passed in America, America declares war. There was a couple Japanese, one particular goes in front of the American embassy and humiliates himself, you know, puts himself on fire like the Buddhist priest did in Vietnam. That's not the end of that story. The, the, the major political and military figures, we're talking the chief of staff, they go to his funeral to let people know that what America did. The Japanese constitution, I know I'm digressing, is very unusual pre-war. You had two, two power centers. The civilian government, the military, did not report to the civilian government like it does the United States. It reports directly to the emperor. During the Meiji times, you had a very strong emperor. He was in charge. He took control. He, he was in charge. By the time Hirohito comes on, the military is reporting only to the military, technically to the emperor, but he's kind of told, this is what we're doing. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And uh, so the military is on its own. So when the military says, when the civilian government says, don't invade China, they invade China. Don't cross, the, go, go, don't cross Manchukuo into China. They just, obey, they just ignore it. So you have two... The two things. So I get that into the book also, trying to give people, not like I do now as a primer, but we see it through the eyes of a 13, 14 year old girl, but we see what's going on. So yeah, I try to give the reader a background of, of what was going on in the war, major events like the 1924 Immigration Act, which is a horrible um, thing, the, the insult to a whole uh, race, and what it did uh, in Hawaii and other, other places. And so I take those historical events through the eyes. And then the book ends, like I say, the night before Pearl Harbor. And to get all of it, I just, to do the trilogy, I decided to um, do a lot of the, um, what, what happened in Hawaii after the war, I mean, after the war was declared, and as I mentioned in there, um, how the Nisei were finally uh, allowed to, um, they had to fight to die. Isn't that crazy? They had to fight for the privilege of dying for their country. Um, the battle scenes, of course, take themselves. I have a whole plethora of books that I could take a look. I have over 200 books. I use those as sources. But again, the personal stories is what people drives people on there. So I go to a lot of these um, reunions and so forth. And I always ask people, can you tell me a story? <laughs> I don't need the dates. The books have dates. You know, this happened on September 23rd and this battle in here. I have lots of books in that. But what I want is the, the stories about the about the guy who meets an Italian girl and brings her home and they have kids. Another guy marries a German and we have an Oktoberfest in Hawaii for many years until she passes away. So uh, that's what, you know, drives a book is, is the stories. Mm, let me see. And so then um, for the third part of the trilogy, then um, where, where is this historical trajectory going to be taking us? Well, it's going to take through um, to the end of the war. Uh -huh. And um, by in We'll take the major, we're not going to do every, every battle, we'll take the, the major one. The Battle of Casino is, is huge, so that'll, that'll start the book. Um, we'll have, uh, the, uh, of course, the rescue of the 442nd will be, will be featured. At a month before the end of the war, there's the famous Nisei. Or once again, they're asked to take the German line in Italy. They're still there, even in 19, April 1945, and they've been holding out for more than a year. And in a day, the Nisei do what other units couldn't do in a year. And I don't know if you know about the Battle of Quebec. You, you, you familiar with that at all? Um, well, I actually don't know yeah, too much about it. Okay, well, anyway, in the Battle of Quebec, the French soldiers, they've got, they've got the, the plains of Montcalm, and they've got the, the forts and everything else, and there's a cliff behind it. Of course, nobody can climb the cliff, so you don't have to defend it. Well, the British soldiers climbed the cliff. So 150 years later, what do the Nisei do? They climb the cliff. So they've got soldiers in the regular place to assault, which has been a failure every time for a year from the other units. But what makes it possible, you've got a couple units climbing up there, and they know one or two fall, and they, got, they can't yell when they fall. They have to die quietly. And they get to the top of the hill. Of course, the Germans are completely shocked. And then when, there's, when the shooting starts with the guys climbing on the hill, then the other guys on the bottom come up and it's, it's over in an hour. So that one will be featured. 
And then the MIS, um, you know, the military, there's so many stories. I, I'm going to try to, fit, you know, which ones can squeeze in. You got people with the MacArthur staff, you got them in Okinawa, getting the people out of the caves. You got them in fighting units um, as interpreters um, all over the place. So I have to pick and choose. And sometimes I think I should write a fourth book just on the MIS stories because there's, you know, there were 6,000 guys in the MIS. They were all over the place. Yeah. They're all over the place. Yeah. So I guess to go along with just the multitude of stories that, um, you know, are out there that, that people have carried with them, um, do you feel like uh, a sort of responsibility for your books to serve as a platform to, to get those stories told? I do. I, I, I looked at it this way. There's, there's a lot of books that have been written on the, on the Nisei. In fact, they keep coming out. It's almost like an industry. Mm-hmm. Most of them are nonfiction. Mm-hmm. And I thought it might be interesting if I novelize these heroics. So I have a family, the Takayama family. It starts with Haro. And then she has six children, because in those days, everybody had six to ten, ten children. So at the end of the book and picture bride, the children are all teenagers, or some of them are in their, you know, in their late 20s. Mm-hmm. So the children get more featured in the second book. Two of the children are in Japan, one of them with the Imperial Army, and one of them was working with Dentsu, which is an, um, um, an advertising agency, and she gets uh, um, suspended to the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. And she becomes one of the um, Tokyo Roses. There was one main Tokyo Rose, which I feature by, by name and her background, but there were others that would substitute. So I have one of Harold's children as a part-time substitute. And I talk about, you know, how the Tokyo Rose did and how they, sub, uh, how they um, were able to be cleverly, actually not as, they weren't so bad. Um, they they kind of conned the, the, the Japanese a little bit. Uh, the way they, they handled it. So it could have been could have been worse. And the original Tokyo Rose eventually was exonerated because, you know, she didn't do it, they would have, um, she would have starved to death. Mm-hmm. But so there's a lot of background things like that you, you can re- weave in. Um, mm-hmm. There were a number of, why were Nisei in the Imperial Army? Because they were, they didn't bother to get an American passport. To go to Japan, Anybody born before 1924 was automatically a dual citizen by treaty between America and Japan. It's easy to get an American passport, but a lot of the guys said, nah, I don't want to bother with American passports, stand in line, all that. I, you know, I've already got my Japanese uh, certificate here and I can just go to Japan as a Japanese. So war breaks out. Hey, you're Japanese, not American. You get drafted. And you probably know some of the stories. There are quite a few of them um, in, in there. And, most of them didn't see live duty, but at the end, some of them were on both sides in Okinawa. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, uh, there were so shortage of manpower, and they even put um, Nisei, whom they didn't, the Japanese didn't trust them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think one other thing that comes to mind uh, when I'm, um, you know, reading the books and seeing sort of the the historical context in which. Your, your characters, you know, are living their lives. And um, I, I see that there are sort of larger forces at work that are sh- shaping some of the decisions that, you know, people have to make. And right. um, do you feel like in your books that uh, you're sort of showcasing sort of the, the human dilemmas that people face in the face of, uh, you know, things beyond their control, these greater world forces and, uh, does that in turn sort of in your writing process make you have to try to speculate on how you yourself might have uh, reacted in, in their shoes or uh, how you think people during that era um, may have, you know, made their decisions on how to proceed? You know, that's a terrific question. And I do. And I know it's, it's hard because um, my main character is a woman in the first book, Haru. And she's a Japanese woman, and I'm a, you know, a Caucasian man. I am married to a Japanese woman, but of a different generation. So I did a lot of research, and I, tr- I do try to get into the heads of people. All novels, if, you, if they're, people are going to read them, there has to be a dilemma. It can't just be this happened and that happened and that happened. Otherwise, it's just a, a textbook. So there are dilemmas. What happens when your husband does something bad? Um, one of Harold's 
dramatic moments in uh, Picture Bride is that her husband doesn't want her to go and visit her friend in Molokai, excuse in Molokai, uh, where the leper colony is. One of her Picture Bride friends gets leprosy. She's seven months pregnant. And sure enough, something happens. And she loses the child, her own child. And then there's the other woman's child that she's supposed to pick up to take to the father. But she's lost her child. So can you see a dilemma, some possibilities, what might happen? And I was actually in Molokai, and that scene came to me when I was on a donkey. And it's 1,300 feet from the bottom of um, the leper colony to the top where you can get out. In those days, that's the only way you could get in by ship or you could get in by donkey. I actually flew in, <laughs> but I took the donkey trail out. And as I climbed up that trail with the donkey, afraid of the donkey's going to fall off because I'm very narrow, um, I had this scene on the, on the, on the beach. Um, so, yeah, there's great d dilemmas uh, that you have to have. Um, and sometimes there's not, a, there's not a perfect answer, but yet people's lives have to, have to go on. And um, with Charles' children, of course, there's going to be love relationships. Um, and they're not always handled uh, the way mom and dad would like them to be handled. <laughs> and how, how, do you, how do you do that? The, the dilemma. Uh, what happens if a girlfriend finds out that you've been uh, cheating on her? What does she do? Well, does she forgive him? Or does she say, you're out of here? And um, so that has a place uh, in there. And I have one scene where um, a girl of the night is trying to coach the girlfriend that says, this man really loves you. So, you know, what do you do with that scene? So. Oh. Yeah, I think that's uh, fascinating. And I think the human element is what makes a lot of this so compelling, right? To, to your readers is just, you know, just trying to think about what that, like the reader might do in, in a similar situation or. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the no-no boys. What would you know? The no-no boy story, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I have characters in in the book, um, where through through these characters we see the, the dilemma these these boys faced, and um, a lot of them were considered cowards, um, terrible people, um, and other people look at them as as heroes. Um, <laughs> And even after the war, when they got back, they, some of them were ostracized by, by people who said you were, you know, you were cowards and you, you suffered. And other people looked at them, they stood up for what they believed in and they were willing to take the terrible consequences. Mm -hmm. um, I re it reminded me of when Muhammad Ali, I'm old enough to remember Muhammad Ali didn't step up. And I was one of the few people that said, well, I would have stepped up, but, I, but he gave up a lot. Mm -hmm. He gave up his title and a lot of money because what he believed in. So I said, well, I have to respect that. I don't agree with the decision. So for me, the no, no boys was I didn't agree with what they did, but I respected uh, what they did. So I try to bring that out in, in the book. But you also you got to bring out the full picture that some people did this and that and uh, in the dilemma they faced. And, and some of them wanted to be no, no boys. But if they did, the parents didn't have any money because they had camp jobs that, or the military gave them some money. So, you know, the Hawaiian boys were getting money from the homeland. <laughs> Every month, they, somebody would send them, here's $100, go have a good weekend. Mm -hmm. the, the guys from the West Coast, whatever little money they got, they keep 5 or $10 for Coca-Cola. The rest of the money went to the, the camp for the parents. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, the, the Nono boys was very dramatic. And it'll be featured again in my next book because the story continues on these Nono boys and uh, they went, you know, they, they went to Tule Lake. I'll have scenes from Tule Lake. Oh, great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was going to ask, too, because a question of loyalty is um, so focused on um, the history of our military units, our, our Nisei veterans. Right. Uh, in the course of doing your research, I was wondering um, how much of, like, non-military perspectives kind of played into uh, what, what went into uh, the book uh, in the end or and it sounds like um, you know a lot of that might come later or in the course of uh, telling the stories of uh, what happened at Tule Lake. And yeah, you know I always have to keep in mind 70% of all book buyers are women. Uh -huh. 
I see. And um, so uh, book one, of course, and Haru is a picture bride. But even in book two, which is a lot of fighting, I also have a lot of home front um, stories. What is happening with, with the families? And um, all the ministers, all the priests are gone. So how do people have funerals? And what do they do um, in that? And what happens to the, uh, the women uh, left behind and the, and the boys? So I try to have the, the, the picture bride. And I try to also in the camps, how, what life was a little bit like in, in, in the camp. So I try to have a, a mosaic of what's going on. It's not just this happened in this battle and they won and they lost so many people died. There are uh, battle scenes and all the Medal of Honor winners when they get, this, uh, get their moment. Um, in book one, it ended in the eve of the Battle of Casino. There were only three Medal of Honors, but eight, all 18 others will be incorporated into proof of um, loyalty. They'll get their page. Um, I have a, the Takayama family is the core of the book. And uh, my, the two boys that are in the 100th and the 442nd, um, they have jobs as scouts or forward observers. They, they can be everywhere in the battlefield as, as opposed to a rifleman who's in one unit and can't move very much. But a forward observer or a scout, he's all over the place. So wherever the action is, my guy is there uh -huh. <laughs> witnessing it or hears about it. Um, so that way there I can get in a lot of the real heroics. And when you write a historical novel, you've got um, your historical uh, characters living right along with your fictional characters. Mm -hmm. I see. And um, in the back of my book, I have a list of, you know, who's fiction, most people know, okay, Roosevelt was, you know, real, but there were a lot of other names. So I do let, put down this person was real, this person was my imagination. Right. And actually, I had um, a question about one of the early slides in your presentation um, where you're talking or you're giving um, a quote from um, uh, George Patton, uh, where he uh, describes the Japanese as uh, an orange country and the, the people as, I guess, like a, an orange race. Right. And I think for me, that was striking because that was the first time I'd seen um, East Asians characterized as orange, right? Usually, I think they're identified as being yellow. Well, uh, he was just is, coming, is he it, could have called them the purple people. He was just yeah, coming yeah. up with a euphemism because uh -huh. um, he didn't want to put down Japanese, but everybody knew the orange people were Japanese, but he could have called them the purple people or uh -huh. the gremlin people. He just came up with something. He called them the orange people from the orange country as yeah. opposed to, so I don't think it was a color of the skin so much as it was some euphemism uh, mm -hmm. of that. Um, and it's a long, the report, you can go online and d dig it out. And uh, I've read parts of it. Um, uh -huh. In my book, I, I have a, a couple more paragraphs um, uh -huh. that are discussed at the Takayama family because um, one of the sons is working with the morale committee, the fictional. So that way there you get to go on what's, what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he wrote a very extensive report um, part of it was actually used by the FBI when they actually picked up the 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. Part of that was based on Patton's recommendation. Of course, Patton thought they should almost everybody should should go. But you okay. start off with the leaders, and then work your way down. Okay. Yeah, because I, I was just wondering, like, yeah. if if the context of that quote was was he referencing like a map that showed Japan in the color orange or something like that? No, everybody just knew. Uh -huh. you know, there's no maps, but very detailed. You know, this should happen and the this will be likely, and it's a very it's 60 some pages. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole idea was that you've got this group of disloyal people, and mainly they're worried about Oahu. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, we lost a lot of our, our planes uh, that were all, when the zeros came in from the, um, uh, from the Okage and the other um, Japanese um, aircraft carriers, they couldn't believe that all the American um, planes we're all in the middle of the runway stuck together. Mm -hmm. Nice roll. The reason for that was we all know that these distrusted Japanese, if you put the plane, scatter them around, all the Japanese would be cutting out of the fence and blowing up airplanes. That was the thinking of some of the senior brass, despite the assurances they were getting from Shivers, their own Navy intelligence, they kept looking for spies and they couldn't find any, but they knew they were there. Right. So to protect it from these spies, they made easy targets for the Japanese coming in and say, oh my God, look at all these planes. They can just run them out 
So uh, they blew up a lot of um, the Air Force at Hickam uh, because of the bias and prejudice of senior officers mm -hmm. giving in to their uh, venting their bias in a way that was very destructive. Yeah. Prejudice has practical consequences that are very serious, just in a military sense. If you give into that, you make terrible decisions. Sure, yeah. Um, so I don't, not seeing any questions coming from the audience, um, but I did want to give you a chance at this point um, before we, we close out, um, if, if there's anything else that uh, has struck you in the course of doing your research and uh, writing the book that uh, you felt like uh, would be beneficial for the audience to understand about uh, your process or uh, the history that, that, that's laid out in, in the books themselves? Um, Boy, that's a large question, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just kind of <laughs> wanted to give you extra time and space to, to include anything that uh, didn't necessarily maybe fit neatly into the presentation, but would be yeah. of interest. Now, I'll, I'll say this, it's changed my life in ways that I did not anticipate. I, I thought I would write one one book and do it in two years and then move on to something else. And I never thought it would end up uh, being my life's work. Uh, you know, I'm 77 years old. So, um, you know, I exercise every day to make sure I stay healthy to finish the next uh, the next book. So it's uh, it, it's. It's affected me in a lot, a lot of ways. My wife and I enjoy traveling. So where some people doing research is a burden, uh, we enjoyed um, going to Amakusa and going to the, uh, you know, the temple in Hiroshima, um, going to the battle uh, fields. I'm not saying it was like a picnic, but um, visiting these scenes with, with veterans or with the children of, of veterans uh, was very emotional. And you get to understand the empathy. And I think if you're, if you're a writer, uh, you got to have some empathy, um, otherwise you can't get the story across. So um, people like Lawson Sakai, and there are other veterans that I've met from time to time, very reticent. Um, the archives of the University of Hawaii has a lot of personal stories, and of course I visited uh, the museum, the Japanese museum, and Danchu, and all those places. Um, I just I have to say that the, the, the writing the book um, has changed my life in personal ways that I, I didn't realize I was the commitment I was, I was making, and and so it's been a joy. Um, the coronavirus has been very uh, disruptive, as it has to a lot of people. Um, I was supposed to, you know, you and I doing this on Zoom. Um, I had already set up six or seven confirmed bookings on a, what I call my West Coast tour. I was going to drive from Atlanta. Uh, to Denver and Oregon, all the other places in you know, Kinakunya bookstores. I did four or five of them last time. I thought I'd do probably 10 of them this time. So I figured I have 25 to 40 speaking engagements. You know, people buy books and then they, they stock them. Of course, all that's gone. The same thing in Hawaii, a lot of bookstores here I, I, I'd done before. I had two or three of them already booked. So that's, it's been disruptive for um, a lot of people. So I appreciate doing these um, meetings like, like this here and get the story across. I don't know how many people we have, but if they want to order the book, they can do it from Amazon. Um, or if they want it from me personally, um, they can go to my, uh, send me an email or go to my Facebook, it's under Malahan, and go to the message box. And I'll send them an autographed um, copy, uh, 20 bucks, either book or both books, 20 bucks each, and uh, mail it to them uh, free so that they don't have to, you know, if they order it from me, they don't pay extra if they ordered it from from Amazon. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a, um, a hell of a role, a hell of a story. Um, and it's been an inspirational uh, to me what these people did. So um, they really were heroes. And often I wonder, uh, Aroka, you know, how do these people do it? What drives people to so willingly risk their lives knowing the probability of death in certain circumstances is fairly high. I don't mean one out of two, but when you're going against the machine gun nest, it just, it's kind of a risky proposition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know it. And yet, these guys did it. Um, mm -hmm. Two of them, those Medal of Honor winners, survived the war. One of them, Hashimoto, died the next day. Mm -hmm. 
and he got his Medal of Honor anyhow. You know, his family got it from Bill Clinton when the uh, Senator Inouye got him to go back to the records and say, let's, let's take a look at who, who, what would you have done if we hadn't been Japanese? And um, then they, they made it right. They made it right. But they earned them. And none of those Medal of Honor runners was, a, you know, let's, let's put two more in for the bucket. They, all, they were all earned. Well, certainly, um, I think a lot has been made in our community about the actual, um, you know, the blood sacrifice that yes. you know, 100th and 442nd made on behalf of our community uh, so that we could have uh, the level of acceptance in American society uh, that, you know, kind of came with uh, what they were, you know, proven to give to our country. And so that's, that's something that I think, um, you know, many people will, will get out of uh, reading the books too, you, you know, from a historical work of fiction, you can still glean a lot of actual information on uh, sort of real life, you know, life and death situations and consequences. Yes. yes. Yeah. For sure. Um, you know, President Truman, when he had the uh, 442nd come to the White House, um, summarized it very, very well. He says, you guys had, you fought two battles, one against Germany, and wants to, to prove your loyalty. And he says, you've won both battles. So Truman had a, a sense, you know, I wish we had somebody like him right now uh, in the White House. Because um, I know for the Asian uh, community in the West Coast have been subject to some very nasty situations. Mm -hmm. And a couple of Trump people who are Nisei are starting to realize that when you let this genie out of the bottle over one group of immigrants, once the genie is out, the prejudice is not just aimed at the one particular group you don't like. They go after all the groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some people, um, they've zeroed in on Asian Americans. And uh, um, some, so far, no deaths, but you know, you've probably seen some of the stories. Mm -hmm. um, so you, it's, um, but, but yes, the 442nd, um, they proved to America they had made a horrible mistake. There was a collective guilt over what they did. And today, when you think of the Asian community, uh, you think of success. I mean, I know there's homeless Asians, it's like they're homeless everybody, but when you think about it, you think about doctors and business people and, and politicians and so forth, that the average American, the Asian American is more successful than the average American. That's just the way it is. Um, of course, that itself, <laughs> it's a different type of prejudice. You know? sure. <laughs> so. Well, um, in any case, I think uh, we're kind of coming to a close for our time with you today, but I just wanted to express again how much we appreciate you uh, being able to come to um, our space today and, and present your books, but also all the work that went into researching it and the connection that you, you've made with um, our community as well in the course of uh, writing your book and, and telling these stories for people. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, my pleasure, I can, I can tell you. Uh -huh. Okay, so I guess this is the end. So thank everybody and uh, appreciate it. Sure, Enjoy. and then uh, hopefully um, at some point when this pandemic is all over, uh, you'll be able to make your way back to the West Coast. And, uh, well, I'll be delighted. I'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but yes, that would be nice if I could uh, do that when everybody gets vaccines. I think we're talking two years before it's normal again. Yeah, well, hopefully we can see you and uh, have you drop by the center to say hi. Yes, look forward right. to it. Thank you. All right, everyone. thanks okay. again, and uh, please be well and stay safe. Okay, will do. All right, All right. thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Let me get to the...